a consultant for uh, Morrison and Forrester um, and a uh, visiting fe senior fellow for the Center for American Progress and actually about a hundred other things. Um, I, I read his bio last night. It's extraordinary. Um, uh, similarly, actually, on my right, uh, Professor Norman Sada, who is a professor at Carnegie Mellon um, since 1991 um, and an expert in a variety of different things ranging from e-supply chain management to mobile commerce. Um, uh, and most relevantly for this panel, um, has spent a lot of time thinking about internet privacy and security um, and uh, the relationship between internet technologies and society. Um, and uh, on our far right here, uh, Gerald Hughes, who uh, most importantly for this panel was the founder of a company called MQ, which was later acquired by VeriSign, where um, Gerald now hangs his hat as the director for product management. Um, and uh, he runs the mobile content delivery system for VeriSign. And, and as mentioned earlier today, mobile content delivery um, means an awful lot of different things. Um, and obviously, in, in the context of, of what we're discussing here today, uh, has some interesting implications. So I'm um, uh, going to jump right in here. Um, actually, why don't we start with uh, Peter um, and uh, building privacy and security into the infrastructure um, and uh, uh, some of the, the things that you found in your work. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you uh, to the organizers uh, uh, for, for putting on this event. Uh, I have four points, uh, which I'll sort of tick through. Uh, the first one comes out of my experience uh, from, from HIPAA, the medical privacy world. Um, I lived through that in excruciating detail in 99 and 2000. Um, but here's, here was the big picture. Uh, in 1996, Congress said in, in the HIPAA law that um, we were going to move all the payment records for medical uh, procedures in the country into electronic form. It was a shift from paper records for payment to electronic records. And as, they, as Congress uh, said we're going to do that for payments, they realized, gee, that means all these health records are going to be zipping around electronically. And they said we have to do privacy and security at the same time. So the HIPAA privacy rule, the HIPAA security rule, was put, were put in specifically because we realized if this huge new kind of data was going to be zipping around, we had to build in privacy and security at the same time. And that message, build them at the same time, put it into the architecture, seems to me the exact right message for location information as companies are trying to figure this out. Uh, the second uh, point, uh, I, I think part of any talk at this thing is somebody sitting here and then waving their cell phone around. Uh, so uh, I'll do it too because I want to be part of the cool crowd. And um, I have teenagers and I aspire to cool. Um, this is a tracking device. Uh, until, uh, so 10 years ago, most people didn't have cell phones. Today, most people do. And so society's in a one-time shift from not having a personal tracking device to having a personal tracking device. Uh, somebody in the earlier panel said, we don't know what the social mores are going to be about that. But I'll just say, as a society, whether it's Big Brother, whether it's other things, we've just never had a time when it was trivially easy to have a, a breadcrumb record of everywhere I've gone. And somehow that's going to matter. Somehow, 10 years, 50 years from now, we will have gotten to a different point where we'll have worked out what the rules are for that. But having a personal tracking device, that's big news because we've never had that capability before. Now, in other areas, um, when we've had new kinds of uh, uh, very granular information, Societies reacted by having laws. So cable TV, what you watch at 11 at night on cable, we have a Cable Privacy Act. That means that information is generally not allowed to go anywhere except to your cable company. Maybe some people watch some stuff at night they're embarrassed about. Um, also, video rental records. Famously, Judge Bork was up for the confirmation. Some reporter got the list of movies. Turns out Judge Bork likes John Wayne, right? That wasn't the confirmation problem. But it turns out there were members of the US Senate who thought getting a law in place really quickly was a good idea. <laughs> and uh, they passed a law almost immediately for video rental. If we have laws for cable TV and video rentals, having laws or having at least pretty darn good protections around personal tracking devices, we're going to have pretty darn good protections around personal tracking devices. And so we need to uh, anticipate that. And as people are building their business models, they should be anticipating that personal tracking devices, what happens with that, is going to be a subject of intense public discussion over time. A third point, um, and this picks up on Jim's, uh, uh, Jim Dempsey's uh, slide, uh, which is worth underscoring. Whatever you have, the government can get. That was true before the Patriot Act. It's more true after the Patriot Act. 
nothing's further than a search warrant away from being in the government hands. So if you're a company and you don't want to be a sort of personal subpoena service for the government, right, basically you're just a point of contact for the government to get stuff. If you, if you don't want that to be your business model and the way your customers look at you, you should be thinking about, okay, what's my data structure going to be? And there's basically two moves. One move is data minimization. If you don't need it for your business, don't keep it. Don't track it in the first place. Strip it away from the identifiers. Minimize the data. The second point is minimize retention time. Um, and um, these have very good, besides cutting down your subpoena compliance cost and stopping being the every divorce case point of service for everything and all the rest, having every pri there's other advantages to you and your companies if you minimize data and minimize retention. So you'll have uh, fewer problems with data breaches, right? One of the things we've learned is when sensitive data spills, it gets headlines, it gets liability, it gets state AGs and the FTC. And so if you have great big databases, there will be ba great big data breaches. Probably more than 80% of them come from internal people. So that means if you're going to have the big database, you better train like crazy and surveil the heck out of your employees and make sure you never have any bad employees because it'll be really darn tempting for everybody who wants that data to compromise your employees. We've seen this with the IRS. We've seen it with the Social Security Administration. There's a long and sorry history of insiders getting corrupted. Let me give you one example that I've written about in data retention. The example is, let's imagine a world in which there's organized crime just for a moment. Let's hypothesize such a thing. And, and, let's, and let's imagine that you were at organized crime trying to figure out um, things, and maybe you'd really like to have a, a, an up-to-the-minute map of where all the police telephones are around the city right now as you do your operations, right? So that would be a very nice thing. So if you have an in with the location tracking service, you could, in, in any time there's something important going on, track where the cell phones are for the police. Because anything that the police can use to surveil ordinary people, we can use back, in many instances, to surveil the police. And so now, at least if the police force thinks it's great to have these kinds of services, have the police IT people think, how are they going to protect themselves? And then suddenly they say, oh, that's actually a problem. Oh, we hadn't really thought about that. Oh, we need to have an opt-out. And suddenly you start to move down the path towards minimizing data or not keeping the data or having internal checks in place. So a way to reduce all that compliance headache, data breach headache, uh, uh, surveillance back against the police and being a target for organized crime, a way to address all of that is to have less juicy stuff in the database that doesn't help your business. Fourth point, and my last point, and then we'll go on to something happier than what I'm saying. Uh, there's a markup this afternoon in the Senate Commerce Committee of S-428 that I just found out about in the last couple of days. Um, and the, uh, uh, the committee mark, uh, which is subject to amendment, um, uh, let's see, S-428, it has, it will require NTIA, Telecommunications Information Administration, to develop a national plan which must, quote, uh, provide automatic location capabilities for all IP-enabled devices. So basically, this is a national plan that all IP devices, my laptop, my refrigerator, my car, whatever else, all IP-enabled devices would have location built in as a hardware mandate. And the, the law that's being proposed for this afternoon is to come up with a national plan to do that. That's a bad idea. <laughs> it's a tech mandate. It would slow innovation in hardware and software. It would require tracking technology and location that's not linked to public safety. And it should be opposed. Senator Cantwell has an amendment that I've been told will be offered today. It should be supported. It says let's study when it's appropriate to do location tracking, but do not as a matter of legislation mandate all IP-enabled devices to become tracking devices. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't figure out a rationale for the current mark, except they just haven't thought it through. I hope that's true, uh, and it will be changed. Thank you, Peter. That, uh, very interesting stuff. And actually, uh, one interesting point, um, Pete, Peter mentioned uh, that uh, in other, other areas, so with medical records, uh, when, when HIPAA became law, um, there, were, uh, 
there were implications for all the service providers. We're already actually seeing this with, with location. Certainly the Markey Amendment turning location into CPNI was the first example of that. The one thing I would ask is there are FCC and FTC and uh, there are regulators and legislators in this room. To the extent that people start thinking about regulating and legislating, please come talk to the folks at CTIA and folks like uh, myself and our friends at Helio who, who, uh, who are doing this. Um, why don't we move here, um, actually uh, move to Gerald. Um, and this is a, an interesting uh, case. Normally on a panel you don't want somebody to, uh, to explain exactly what it is they do. It it's, comes off as sort of a, a product pitch. But um, in this particular case, we have no buyers um, in the room. And I think it would be of interest to people in the room to understand a little bit about the role within the technology infrastructure of the aggregators. Um, and uh, it, would be, it would be helpful, Gerald, if you could explain a little bit about what m did, what it does, and what role it might play as far as location services in the future. Um, yes, I, so you know, this is interesting if I tied it into the Jim uh, preface about what you know, applies to the carriers versus what applies to other service providers. You know, the role that we play uh, in, the, in the space is we enable companies to do messaging across multiple operators. So a lot, a lot of technology in the wireless space starts on behalf of an operator and companies work directly with that operator to deploy that services. This, that happened with messaging, it's happening with multimedia messaging, and the same thing will happen with, has happening with location-based services, it's starting at the, at the operator. Where we play in is when uh, a company wants to be able to replicate that solution across multiple, multiple operators. You just start from a cell phone, and I'll just focus on, on location. Given a, lo uh, a cell phone, you may want to query uh, the location of that cell phone. Today, you probably have to have a deal with multiple companies uh, for each different operators or work directly with that operator. What a company like uh, MCube did and VeriSign now does moving forward is provide scalability in the ecosystem by just saying, we do all the integration, apply the rules across all the operators and provide a, a, a combined services. So that's basically the role uh, that VeriSign does, primarily focus in application uh, to uh, peer um, uh, services. Uh, this is where the user is interacting with a, co with a company or an automated services. Uh, let's say trying to get, uh, you know, if you type in a short code uh, information on Google, uh, then regardless of what uh, carrier you have on your cell phone, we route out to the ap appropriate operator. Google processes the response, sends it back, uh, and we take care of all the transactions. So that's basically uh, the role we're, we're playing in the messaging space, and location is basically the next, next things uh, people would want to enable, and mostly for the applications we covered earlier. There are social networking application, tagging of information, uh, when people upload the, the information, and advertisement supported uh, kind of services is really going to be big moving forward, where, you know, the same thing, you want to type in pizza and get the various pizza places that pay for placement to, re to respond to, you, to, to, your, uh, to your approach. So that's basically the role uh, we play. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure deployed uh, to uh, do that and a lot of information that we require to be able to track. We need to know this phone number, what care it is. We need to process a transaction. We need to interface to various systems. A lot of data flows back and forth in the system. A lot of these services tend to be uh, you know, uh, paid uh, services, so you also have to track in when did people opt into the services, is the payment happening. Uh, so that generates quite a bit of data uh, that's being used. So a lot of applica applicability to the to the, the uh, what we're just being described. Great, thanks, Gerald. Um, I think one of the more interesting questions that I, we, we will come back to here is is um, who should be aggregating this information, sh or should anyone be aggregating this information? Should it stay sort of under the control of individual operators? Um, so um, moving on here to Norman, um, uh, I know uh, one of the things uh, you've spent a lot of time studying is, is the notion of consumer consent, and uh, I'd love to get your thoughts in regards to a space like this where consent is, is so important um, and, and the information is so highly privileged. Sure. Um, so um, one of the projects that we've been working on at, in, at Carnegie Mellon University over the past few years is a project called My Campus, where we've been looking at uh, different ways of leveraging information about the context of our users to see whether we can provide them with useful applications, applications that presumably will uh, enhance their uh, social life or make them more productive or perhaps uh, both. And we've actually uh, deployed a number of applications on campus, experimented with them over periods of weeks or months at a time to see, in fact, what, what, what would happen. Uh, many of these applications involve leveraging uh, location information, but we've not limited ourselves to that. And one of the things I want to say is that we've only started to scratch the surface uh, in this space. There are tons and tons of applications that are likely to emerge over the years to come. 
one of the things that we also learned as we're trying to essentially develop all these different applications is that uh, a major impediment to adoption uh, has to do with concerns that users have about, about privacy. Uh, the fact that they want to remain in control of who has access to their information. And we started, uh, therefore, working on the development of interfaces that would enable people to perhaps better specify what their privacy preferences were when it came to sharing information, such as location information. And uh, we've analyzed this across uh, lots of users, and I haven't seen many studies, actually, that have done this uh, the way we have. You find lots of surveys out there that sort of address these issues of privacy at a very broad level, asking people, what if you had a service like this? Would you be concerned about your privacy, yes or no? And, and one of the things that we've learned is that when you ask those questions, you don't get very good answers. Users just cannot picture ahead of time how these services are actually going to be used. So it's very hard for them to actually specify what their, their privacy concerns are, what their privacy preferences should be. Uh, instead, we've learned that you really need to uh, try to develop interfaces that are going to be much more usable than what you find uh, today in the marketplace and what people have been able to develop. Uh, that has to do with the fact that not only um, is it the case that users don't understand their, their privacy policies very well when they start using these applications, but also their own behavior changes over time. Uh, that means that uh, perhaps initially they're going to be very conservative, then over time perhaps they're going to start perceiving better the value of these applications. New usage scenarios will emerge, and as a result of that, they will want to actually change their own, their own preferences. Another thing that we've learned is that these preferences tend to be very complex in nature. Uh, you look at many of the services that are available today in the marketplace, and they're basically services that will uh, tell you, uh, okay, this person has the right to see my location under uh, the following conditions, or perhaps will push your location uh, to these people. Often, it's not the case that you want to just have uh, black and white policies of that nature. Uh, you interview users, look at what they're doing, and you find that their policies are uh, much more nuanced that, than that. Perhaps uh, they're willing to let their colleagues see their location when they're on campus, when they're working, but other at other times they want to make their location available to others. Perhaps this has to do also with the particular activities that they're engaged in. Perhaps this has to do with a number of other considerations that we've got a terrible time uh, capturing today. And so one of the things that we've done is we've tried to actually develop a family of interfaces to see to what extent we could help users specify uh, these policies. And we've learned a, a number of different things. I'll try to be fairly brief here because I don't, I don't want to take uh, too much time. But we certainly learned that, um, first of all, users don't know what their privacy preferences are ahead of time. But even when they do, and even if you ask them, specify the following policies using this interface, they tend to very, do a very poor job. That means that the policy they will specify will not actually be doing what they think these policies are doing. And so uh, this brings us to this question that you've asked me about the whole notion of, of consent and uh, you know, whether it's actually sufficient to just uh, write a page, 15 pages or whatever number might be explaining what your service does and expecting users to actually understand, to actually read these things, which they never do in any case, and to actually act upon that. And uh, uh, my conclusion at, at this stage, based on what I've seen with our users, is that this is absolutely not sufficient. Uh, and it's not even sufficient to give them interfaces that will help them specify these preferences because they can't really do a good job. They need a lot of help in refining these policies over time as they better understand the consequences. Of, of, uh, of what these services do, how they're being used by others. And um, one of the things that we found very useful, and there are lots of other things I could talk about, but perhaps one of the things I, I could at least mention before I uh, sort of uh, uh, return the, the microphone back to some, somebody else, one of the things that we've learned is that often it's very useful to provide users with auditing tools. Uh, so they, they uh, specify the user or, or interfaces to specify policies such as I'm willing to let so-and-so or members of the following group access my location under the following conditions. And those conditions might be days of the week, your own location, so for instance when you're on campus or not, uh, ways of also specifying the level of granularity at which you're willing to disclose your information. That's something we haven't talked about very much. We've only talked about cloaking, which uh, presumably is an absolute preference. Uh, people are actually willing to say whether or not they're in town without necessarily letting you know what zip code or what building they're in. Uh, so you've got to deal with that. Uh, the technologies we have also enable you to support white lies. 
So pretending that you are the dentist when, uh, in fact, uh, you are on vacation uh, and, or interviewing for the competition. So those are the sorts of things that you could potentially specify if you had the right interface. The fact of the matter is it's very difficult for users to specify these things. And so one of the things that we found very useful, and that's the point I, I wanted to uh, conclude on, is, is uh, the introduction of auditing tools. So with auditing tools, one of the things that our users can do, for instance, with our people finder applications, is look at the requests that have been submitted by others to access their location whether or not their current policy is granted access or not, what were the conditions at the time of the request, when the request was submitted, and whether or not they were satisfied with that. And this has a, a number of uh, positive effects in terms of adoption. First of all, it's a deterrent for stalking. Um, when people realize that you'll be able to audit their request, they're going to start refraining from uh, sending you uh, multiple requests at times that perhaps don't make much sense. So there is certainly that perception that it's not a one-way street. You also see who is requesting a location. Don't give them a blank check. But beyond that, uh, as they access this auditing information, they get a much better sense of who is asking when, and they get to see whether or not they're satisfied with their, with their existing policies. They, we can use that to then do a number of different things. We can get feedback from our users and actually learn to better capture their policies than they've been able to specify themselves. That can actually be used to provide them with suggestions on how they might be interested in changing their policies. That can be used to get them to better understand how these services are being used. So there are lots of things that can still be done in this space. And so the, the key message I want to get across is that usability is something that one has to look at very closely. It's not the case that you can define a very small set of default policies for these services. The types of usage scenarios they give rise to, the types of pri privacy policies that emerge are very sophisticated. They change significantly from one user to another. And so the development of tools that will empower users to really specify their policies is going to be critical. And that's not just going to be a static interface. It's going to have to be a much smarter interface uh, than that, one that's capable of looking at your feedback and trying to very selectively make suggestions without overwhelming but sufficiently enough that you're going to eventually be able to capture policy that people will feel comfortable with, where they're going to feel that they're actually in control of what happens to their data. Without that sense of control, users are actually very unlikely to adopt these applications. That's a, a very interesting segue into, um, I think, a, the general point around the, the consent that, that people are giving. It's a very complicated problem, and yet if the interface is complicated, um, people won't understand it, and you'll end up with a, a worse scenario than if you, if you perhaps oversimplify the problem. W one thing I want to mention and then ask a question is related to it. Um, Verizon has tried to solve the problem with location privacy uh, working with a third party called Autodesk, and Autodesk has created a platform which is used for all of Verizon's location services, and, and the, the platform allows for you to set your preferences in terms of whether or not your location can be used on an application by application basis, but also, to Norman's point, about at what time of day. So it may be, for example, that if I'm using a social mapping service, I'm very, very comfortable with people knowing, people being the people that I've chosen, knowing where I am from 9 to 5, but not any other time of day, or perhaps during social hours from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m., but not during other times. Um, what are the, what are the um, appropriate things to be asking the consumer um, is, I think, still a very, very open question, and, and, uh, and there is a concern that if you make it too complex, people will not be able to um, figure out, in fact, what it is that they're giving the service the permission to do. So with that, I want to I ask a question of, of all the panelists, which is, where should the, the control over these permissions reside? Uh, within the loop service, it, it actually resides at the application layer within the looped application. Verizon has chosen to, to try to take this problem on using a platform that Autodesk has provided that kind of cuts across that, that, that one operator. Um, it is also theoretically possible that somebody would set preferences for some sort of macro um, uh, provider uh, of the type that MCube has been historically with SMS, they could use that kind of service for, for all of the wireless operators at the same time. And, and there's a question as to where that level of control should reside. I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not the panelists have opinions on that. Maybe we'll start here. Um, honestly, I don't have a, a strong view on where the control would reside. I mean, as I said, looking at this as I do, I tend to look at it from the Fourth Amendment or government access perspective. Um, if it's somewhere, the government will figure out 
quickly where it is. And uh, again, the question remains, what will be there when they come calling and what will be the standard applicable to their access? I think in terms of the design of the technology and the design of the business models, um, to me, one of the key questions that we've uh, otherwise has been talked about is can you run a service without storing a lot of information? And even before that, the question, can you run a service without even generating it at all, or at least without networking it at all? It's an interesting question about whether you push more of the functionality back out to the edges of the network. True user control, of course, is, is that, the, that the intelligence resides on my device. Uh, not in the network. So the telephone, the intelligence was in the network. The internet, the intelligence moved to the edges. Now we're seeing, I think, a reconsolidation of the intelligence back at the network level. Um, and I'm wondering if that, if it has to be that way. That's an interesting question. I can, I can also answer it from precedents that we have in the messaging space where, you know, we probably can rule out one option, which is it really is held by the content provider. And, and the rationale is, is very simple, which is there's too many of them. So it just takes the breach of one of them to cause a lot of problem in the ecosystem. So generally speaking, um, while it's good and you may reach out to the content provider and it's good to put it at the application level, that's probably not sufficient uh, once you get into the uh, thousands of content providers that are connected to the network. So after that, you're left with really two solutions. It has to happen either at the aggregation level or it has to be done at the carrier level. What we have historically seen is different, uh, different operators have taken different policies. Some operators will decide this is really a critical information for their subscribers because in the end they will hold that responsibility of the subscriber and will take that responsibility in-house and that's basically how they're going to make that data available. Other ones may be more open and, to, and put that responsibility with the aggregators. There's only a small number in each geography, so they, they, you know, basically you can find them and they have an incentive to be part of that network, but it has to be in one or those two places. So I, I guess I'll uh, try to uh, see if I can strike something, uh, uh, a position in the middle. I believe it's got to be at all levels. One of the things we haven't talked about uh, very much is, is the complexity of the value chains. Uh, that we find in, in the mobile and pervasive uh, computing space. Uh, the fact uh, of the matter is that uh, cell phone providers are not uh, by nature very good at, at developing content. That means they need to enter partnerships. They need to enter partnerships with organizations that are going to develop uh, the types of applications that will leverage uh, information such as uh, location information. And uh, they certainly have very strong incentives uh, in principle to do that, but they will also want to make sure that this is done within a context that doesn't uh, necessarily endanger uh, their users. So they will certainly want to have some level of control at uh, their own uh, level, but uh, by their very nature, uh, the variety of applications that we're going to see uh, emerging over time will lead to very different sets of usage scenarios. And it's very hard to actually define uh, privacy preferences that are generic and extend across all these scenarios. As, as an end result, you're going to see a need for also defining uh, privacy policies at the level of these individual applications. There's just no way out. Uh, the, the challenge will be to see how many of those applications we can uh, practically deploy and, and yet, in fact, um, support users as they specify all sorts of different policies across different applications. It's a major burden on the user and a potentially a major impediment for the uh, adoption of, of these applications. Uh, it's uh, one analogy that I like to use is uh, when you drive your car, it's not the case that you need to exactly understand everything that's going on under the hood. Uh, and and uh, yet, uh, with just uh, a few gauges, uh, people seem to feel comfortable enough and they go ahead and, and they turn on the ignition and they start driving because they feel that they've got enough control over what's going on. And I think the challenge will be for all these various applications and this emerging ecosystem to actually figure what those controls are. Uh, very interesting point. That the hybrid model does seem to be the one that the industry is is moving towards, at least right now. If uh, there are services um, launched on Verizon, for example, they have to go through the Autodesk platform, but then there are a separate set of permissions kind of within the application, and, and hopefully it doesn't become too burdensome for the consumer, but I think we're just figuring that out. We are unfortunately running uh, very late on time. I think maybe we have time for one question. <laughs> I have not considered auditing uh, previously as uh, maybe a solution to inform, perhaps more importantly, updates. 
consumer uh, consent and, and awareness. But it seems that seems that for auditing to be effective, it would clash with the goal of data minimization. How extensively has the industry uh, considered this option, the auditing option, as a way to deter stalking and sort of inform and maintain current consent? And if, if not, what would you consider the minimum amount of information necessary to be stored to make auditing both a uh, realistic and an effective uh, solution for consumers? So the, the question was addressed to industry. I'm not from industry. I'm, I'm with the university. But I can certainly tell you from our experience where we are. And, and we're still learning as, as we go. Uh, one of the things that we've learned is that uh, things that happened a month ago are not very useful when it comes to auditing. People just have a very poor recollection of what the situation was and, and what they really wanted to do. So the amount of data that you actually need to collect for the purpose of auditing is somewhat limited. Uh, what the ideal uh, length of time is, I, I don't have a final answer uh, to that, but I would expect that it's in the order of about a week. And, and beyond that, I think that the usefulness, in fact, uh, goes down very quickly. And just, uh, so another name for auditing is consumer access to their own data, which is part of the standard set of privacy protections that you have here and in Europe and other places. Um, and uh, again, the point was fairly limited amount of data could give me a pretty good audit trail of who's been pinging me, how many times, et cetera. And that's really about me and, and for, for me, the consumer. And that may be very sensible to keep, um, even if you don't have a sell-by-sell -sell track of where I've been during that month. And on, a, on a practical level, um, the, with the services that are currently deployed, um, with ours, for example, you get an SMS once a month reminding you that you're, you have a location service on your handset and that you are currently sharing your location. It's, it's not much of an extensive audit, but it is, I mean, it is certainly um, the kind of thing that reminds people, and, and from an anti-stalking perspective, actually, one of the emerging best practices is to send an SMS to a handset with a recently deployed location service um, at an unpredictable time um, so that the, if somebody has put this onto somebody's phone, say, unwittingly, it can't be picked off um, and do this several times, send an SMS, letting the person know that there is, in fact, a tracking service on their handset, and more importantly, how to turn it off if uh, it's not something that, uh, that they actually want on their phone. Um, and uh, that, that has started to emerge as kind of one of the things industry is doing. All right, we've got time for one more question. Well, I, yeah. And, and, sorry. While, you, while she's getting the mic, one of the one of the byproducts of the movement of information out of the home, off of the laptop, out of your control onto the networks is that not only can the government get it under a lower standard, but they can get it without notice to you. Um, so one of the important Fourth Amendment protections is notice. If the government, even if it serves a subpoena on me, it, I know what's happening and what's going on. One other totally different model of approaching this is not, not raising the standard for government access, but providing the notice, contemporaneous notice, which I think has a huge, and it, it is applicable in the non-governmental arena as well. I mean, if, if, if the people that I Google knew I was Googling them, I think I would Google fewer people. <laughs> Well, just um, a follow-up to something that Professor Sada was saying about how little consumers know about the implications of what they're consenting to or applying for. This may sound a little ingenuous, but have you tested um, sort of scenarios with consumers like um, ex-boyfriend stalking you, ending up stalking you, or ex-friend ending up sharing photos of you, just sort of, you know, seeing if something in their lives would sort of trigger intelligent responses? So actually we've tried. It, it's very challenging to reproduce those types of, of uh, behaviors. So a lot of what we do involve uh, field studies where we deploy real devices with real services. And in that context, it's very hard to obviously reproduce the, the types of scenarios that you're talking about. So we've also done lab studies where we actually uh, had uh, forms, online forms, that people would go ahead and, and fill uh, describing information about their lives, who their friends were, boyfriends, and, and the like, and then uh, randomly generated scenarios, including scenarios that are sort of uh, fairly unique that you're unlikely to catch in a pilot with uh, 20 or 30 users uh, for a few weeks, but that you can actually generate to try to see what sorts of, of response they would have. 
And uh, we've, we've seen some, uh, obviously, interesting uh, results, the sorts of uh, results that you would expect to see, that people are clearly not very comfortable with those types of situations. But uh, we've all, always been wondering to what extent that data uh, was really uh, credible, uh, at least to analyze some of the other issues that we're looking at in terms of what it takes to properly uh, capture uh, people's policies, just because it's so hard to really replicate realistically those scenarios. It's one thing to say, well, this is what happens. What would you want to do? Uh, it's another thing to actually see that happen in, in reality. So those are scenarios that are very hard to, to uh, actually scientifically study. Peter, Peter's just got one sentence and we'll wrap up here. Um, uh, Loretta Garrison from the FTC is here and she was one of the people leading the financial regulators effort to figure out how to do privacy notices around financial records. And they did, a, they did focus groups, a bunch of state of the art on research. And so that's one area where the complexity of financial services got really studied about how to do notices and consent. So I commend you to the FTC and the other banking regulators on that. I think that's it.